forsake his wit his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God watch it for he will abundantly pardon that's one of the things that God does abundantly God abundantly pardons you know what a pardon is it's an act of mercy that's what pardon is it is of the utmost importance to the one who's about to face execution. Uh, I read the story. I suppose it's true, but it's so far back in time, it's hard to verify it. Dealing with Napoleon. A mother sought a pardon for her son from Napoleon. Uh, the emperor said that it was the man's second offense, and justice demanded his death. The mother said, I don't ask for justice. I plead for mercy. But the emperor said... He does not deserve mercy. The mother replied, Sir, if it were, it, uh, it, um, Sir, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is all I ask. Oh, yeah. That's exactly right. Mercy is far beyond what you deserve. Oh, yeah. None of us deserved the pardon of our sins being forgiven. Amen. Yeah. And yet God doesn't just pardon our sins, but God abundantly pardons our sins. Yeah. I mean, God could just simply pardon a sin, a particular sin, a set of sins, but he abundantly pardons in that he forgives all sins, all transgressions, all iniquities, past, present, and future. God, in that way, we oftentimes think about one sin we need God to forgive, and that's the, the, the minuteness of God, but we don't think about the magnitude of God in that he forgives all sins, past, that's the abundance abundant pardon that God gives to you and I. Amen. Exodus 34 verse 9, Moses begged for a pardon. He says, pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for thine inheritance. In Numbers 14 verse 9, Moses again begs for, from God a pardon. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy. David begged for a pardon in Psalm 25, verse 11. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Paul actually received a pardon in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, 1, verses 12 and 14, where he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy. Why? Because I did it ignorantly, ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. You know what Paul needed? He needed a pardon. Yeah. You know what that mother needed for her son? She needed a pardon. You know what you needed? You needed a pardon Amen. to be forgiven of all your sins. But what is a pardon if it's not received? In order for a pardon to be effectual, you have to receive the pardon. Napoleon simply could have granted the pardon, but the son could have said, I'm going to die instead of be pardoned. I read this story in 1830. Again, so far back, it could be a wives' tale. I don't know for sure, but for the sake of the illustration, a man named George Wilson was convicted of robbing a U.S. mail service, uh, the U.S. mail service. And he was sentenced to be hanged. President Andrew Jackson issued a pardon for Wilson. But Wilson refused to accept it. The matter went to the Supreme Court where Chief Justice John Marshall ruled that Wilson would have to be executed. The decision came down and Marshall wrote, A pardon is a slip of paper the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, it is no pardon. You know, God has given every individual a slip of paper that they should be pardoned of all their sins, of all their transgressions, of all their iniquities. They've been, they've been given the get-out-of-jail-free card. They've been given the ability to be justified, to be washed, to be cleansed, to be made righteous in the blood of of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it does an individual no good if they don't receive and sign their name to that pardon. Salvation is not intellectual alone. 
It might come intellectually in that you have an awareness, a knowledge of your sin, of your transgressions, and the consequences of dying in your sins, but it goes far beyond just the intellect. It must move down into the emotion. It must move down into the will of man to receive what God has already put into action. To receive what God has put forth, the individual must come unto God, must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You must receive the pardon unto yourself so that you might, in fact, be abundantly pardoned. The Bible says that uh, the law entered that, great, that offenses may abound, Romans 5.20. But I like this. Where sin abounded... Grace yeah. did much more about it. When you read that Bible, you realize just how wicked you are. Oh, yeah. Now you may measure you might measure yourself up to you know Charles Manson if he's even still relevant today. I don't know of anybody else. Puff Daddy, is that okay? Can you use that? There you go. More relevant. You may say compared to P. Diddy, I'm I'm as clean as the driven snow. I'm an angel. But if you measure you up to God. You're as guilty as P. Diddy. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. And in that way, we must realize that when we read that Bible, it reveals to us how sinful we truly are. And so when he says, for he will abundantly pardon, it's because you need the abundance of a pardon for the abundance of your sins. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Spurgeon says this, the pardon of God may well be abundant, for it wells up from an infinite fountain, mercy which endureth forever. Mercy is the attribute from which that pardon springs. Pardon is the child of mercy, not of justice. And we may reckon that God will give abundant pardon because he delighteth in mercy. All the attributes of God are well balanced. Like himself, they are infinite. And no one of them entrenches upon or dims the luster of another. He is infinitely just, yet infinitely good. Infinitely powerful, yet infinitely tender. That goes back to the magnitude. The, the just awe-inspiringness of God in all of his splendor, and yet in just the finite little thing that he does for you and I. There's a poem that was written called The Sufficiency of Pardon. See here an endless ocean flow of never failing grace. Behold a dying Savior's veins, the sacred flood increase. It rises high and drowns the hills, has neither shore nor bound. Now if we search to find our sins, our sins can ne'er be found. Awake our hearts, adore the grace that buries all our faults and pardoning blood that swells above our follies and our thoughts. That's the abundant promise of God pardoning all sins, past, present, and future, found in His grace and mercy. Number two is God abundantly provides. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. That's actually not even the right verse. I cut off in my in my paper here. I cut off the verse I'm looking for. Go to 2 Peter anyways. We'll close with that in just a little bit. That's the third point. I cut off my second point about God abundantly providing. That's funny. In Psalms, he talks about the abundant provisions. In Psalms, if you type in that word abundantly, you'll find the word provisions there. But in the book of Psalms, he talks about abundant provisions. And in verse 15 of that chapter of Psalms, wherever it is, he talks about food and clothing. You know, God pardons us of all of our sins and our transgressions, and that's a wonderful thing. And that's the magnitude of what God does and saves us from hell. But then God takes care of the little things, the everyday, the mundane things for us, and that God provides all of our food and clothing. In Luke chapter 1, verse 53, he says, He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent away empty. That's kind of a peculiar thing. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 8, he says this, And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. 
God provides all of our everyday needs, all of our essential needs like food and clothing. There's verses in the Bible that talks about I'm not seeing the righteous begging for bread. The Bible says, um, what does he say? He says, all these things the Gentiles seek, you know, he goes, you know, food and clothing, all those things the Gentiles seek. The Lord's like, if I know how to clothe the lilies of the field, oh, yeah. if I know how to uh, 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 feed the sparrows, can I not oh, take yeah. care of you? Yeah. Aren't you worth more than the sparrows? Yeah. You know, yeah. the hairs of our heads are numbered. I always tell yeah. a barber that when I get a haircut. <laughs> That, that that he knows every single one of the hairs yes. that are presently, Amen. will be future, the ones we don't have anymore. Amen. Amen. God provides everything that yes. we need. Amen. Every And we, we take it for granted that the food's always going to be there. You know why you take it for granted? Because God is always allowed. You say, yeah, but that's my ability to work. I don't work for a living. I'm a self-made man. If God were to stop you tomorrow yes. from ever being able to work, you would not be able to work. That's how big God is. That's how big he is. That if he said tomorrow, aneurysm, stroke, brother Juno, you wouldn't be able to, to do the things you do today. And yet God still provides food and clothing for you and I. Not just food and clothing, but in that same Psalms, and in that same chapter, verse 11 and 12, he provides family and friends. Amen. We're talking about the abundance, the abundantness of God, how God gives us life abundantly, food, clothing. But some of the abundant things that we don't recognize is the family and the friends that we have in our life. And they didn't just come by chance. They didn't just come by circumstance. God sent them into your life. Yeah. I was talking about the stop before the service, and he didn't know what I was going to preach, and I didn't know what he was going to say. But he says, I can look back in my life and say, God ordained, got organized, and got orchestrated individuals in my life that I needed to be the man who I am today. Amen. You know how that person came to be? God. Amen. Don't sell God short. Right. God sent that family. God sent those friends. God sent you that wife. God sent you that husband. God gave you those children. I don't times we amen. wish he hadn't, amen. But that's the times where we're bitter and angry and complaining. If we will look past our flesh and our self-ignorance uh, um, and our self-desires, we will recognize that the people that are in our life are for our good. Amen. And they're from God. Psalm 127, 3 and 5, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Now listen to this. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. You say, what's that talking about? The quiver is the thing that holds the arrows. A man that has his quiver, a man that has uh, the arrows in his home, and he knows, Lord, these are my children that you've given me. There's no more room in this quiver, this household, for any more children. Lord, I'm satisfied with one, two, or 20. I don't know what it is for you. For us, it's two. Amen. amen. And that's when my quiver was full. Amen. You know how I got there? God. Amen. I, can't, I can't make children grow in the womb. I can't make children come out of the womb. I can't make children survive outside of the womb. I can't do any of that. It's God that provides amen. for my children. Amen. He uses me. He uses this church. He uses you all to help us to be a blessing. He uses your job, your strength, your mind, your resources, your intellect, your intelligence, your school and your education, your teachers. Yes, but ultimately it is God that supplies you with all the sufficient things you need in every good work like raising a family. Amen. Proverbs 17, verse 6. Children's children are the crown of old men. So grandchildren. Grandchildren are the crown. I was watching Miss Lisa holding, I think it was Isla on her lap. And it, and it blessed my soul. It blessed my heart. To, there she is as a, as a grandma. Can I call you grandma? I know you're not old enough to be a grandma, but she's, she, she is. Okay. There she is. You know, that brings her joy. That, that's a crown upon her head. That's a jewel in her, in her crown, if you will. And the glory of children are their fathers. They should be. Amen. They should be. Proverbs 31, 28. The whole Proverbs chapter 31 is all about the wife and the mother. And the Bible says, Her children arise up and call her blessed. 
Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Amen. Husbands, we've got to do a better job at praising our wives for all that they do. Why? Because it sets the example in the home. Yeah. Children will not bless a mother the father does not praise. Friends. The Bible says the man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Amen. And there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Amen. Mark 5, 19 says, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and had compassion on thee. Let me ask you a question. Do you have any saved friends that will be excited about what God has done for you? Yeah. If you do, God said them. Yeah. See, I don't have any friends that if I said praise the Lord in front of them, they'd, they'd faint. They wouldn't know anything about praising the Lord. <laughs> you might want to start praying for some fr godly friends. Yeah. Yeah. Godly influences in your Christian life. If you have godly influence, if you have godly friends that you can praise the Lord, you can call them and say, pray for me. Then you can call them and say, praise the Lord with me. Or you can tell them what you heard in church today, how God spoke to you intimately, personally. If you have friends like that, the Bible says the man that has friends must show himself friendly, but that's a provision from God. Yeah. If you have a wife that will pray with you, that will praise God with you, that will loves to hear the Bible read or the Bible talked about in the home, that's God that did that. Yeah. See, I don't have that. Then pray you wait for God to send you one like that, because if you don't got one like that in the home, it's tough to live around. Yeah. It's love, tough to live with. Yeah. Acts 27 verse 3. He says, there we touched down the next day in Sidon, and Julius cursely entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends. Paul had friends. Do you have any friends? Friends. The one that says a friend sticketh closer than a brother. Actually, Amen. is that what it says? A friend, that, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You got anybody like that in your life? You need that. You need that. I'd start praying. One of the things I prayed for for this church was God sent godly Christian men to this church. Amen. You know why? I need friends. I need manly friends. I need godly man, men in this church that will help uh, be a friend to me. And uh, Listen, a friend doesn't always just tell you what you want to hear. That's right. Amen. A friend loveth at all times. Iron sharpeneth iron. So a man, the countenance of his friend. Sometimes you need to be told, man, you're out of the will of God. Yeah. You're, you're going against scripture. You need to stop that. You need to knock that off. That's not healthy for you. That's not good for you. They talk about accountability partners and things like that. 3 John 1 14, but I trust I shall shortly see thee and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet thy friends by name. I'm not talking about Facebook. I've got 4,000 friends. You can't greet them face to face by name. If you saw them face to face, you wouldn't yeah. know their name. Yeah. I was going through my friends, Facebook friends the other day, and a lot of them got names that come out of the Middle East. Yeah. Can't pronounce it. Never seen them before. Don't know how they became my friends. Guess that I answered a friend request. I'm not talking about Facebook friends. I'm talking about the kind of friends you can see in church. Yeah, amen. The kind of friends you can see in a Bible study. The kind of friends you can see in a prayer group. The kind of friends you can see at a men's fellowship or a women's fellowship. The kind of friends that you can see doing Christian things together. I'm not talking about bar friends. I'm talking about golf friends and golf plays. I'm talking about Christian friends that will encourage you with the Word of God. That will strengthen you. That will hold you up and lift you up when you are at your bottom's end. And then God provides things like finances. He provides food and clothing. He provides friends and family. He provides things like finances. The finances that we need so that we might honor God first and foremost. You know, when money comes into you one way or the other, whether you work for it, whether you find a dime on the street, and I'm not above picking up a dime or a penny on the street, to be honest with you. <laughs> Pens or tails on a crack, touch, break your mother's back. I don't care, man. I'm picking it up. Hey, in fact, there's actually this penny I run on Hall Street in Concord. And there's this, I haven't picked it up yet, so I'll be honest. But there's this penny that like is right in the midst of like all this shattered glass. And I run over it every single morning. It's just laying there. I'll think every morning, I'm like, I pick up that penny. got to pick up that penny, but I haven't picked it up yet. So maybe there's some pennies you don't want to pick up, yeah. amen. But you know when God blesses you with finances? When God blesses you with that paycheck or that bonus or whatever it is, you know... When kids get that stuff in, in Christmas cards or whatever it is, they need to know what it is to thank God for that, that money. Amen. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Yes. It doesn't say money is the, the root of all evil. Yes. It says the love of it. Yes. If you can have money and praise God with it, yes. 
Yeah. You're not loving money. You're loving God who <laughs> supplies you because ain't none of us getting by on our good looks. Amen. <laughs> ain't none of us getting by that way. We got to honor God with our finances. When God gives you finances, it ought to be to provide for your family. It ought to be to provide food and clothing for your family. It ought to be to provide opportunities to spend time with your friends. I'm not one of those pastors that says, you know, every dime has to go into the church. Every dime you make has to go to the church. Listen, I think you ought to take your wife out, your children out. I think you ought to take your friends out. I think you ought to buy, be willing to buy a meal for a friend. Don't just always allow them to buy the meal for you. I think it's good to have... God didn't just give you money to pump it back into the church. God gave you money to put it into the economy. The word economy is in the Bible as the word dispensation. Everything within your sphere, that is your economy. Your, your home, your bills... Your, 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 your um, activities outside of the home, whatever life you surround yourself with, that's your economy. And we're supposed to be good stewards with the dispensation, with the dispensing of, with the economy God has given us. So go out for a meal, go to a ball game, uh, go hunting or fish, don't do all that. Just don't do it to the exclusion of God. Yeah. And a Christian friend would not want you to do that. They wouldn't ask you to do that. They would simply say, praise God if we can, and praise God if we can't. Amen? Amen? I won't give you all the verses on that for sake of time. Are you still in Peter? Yes. Second Peter 1. I know that's the right chapter. i got to find out where we were supposed to be in Psalms. That's your homework this week. Amen? Huh? Somebody said it. What? I think it was 128 or 129. Psalms? Well, praise it. See them. I got to go back and look at that. Thank you, brother. Second Peter chapter one. Uh, look at verse number one. Uh, Second Peter chapter one. Look at verse four. Second Peter chapter one and verse four. He says there, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might. Be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Notice he says, exceeding great. And then he says promises. Look at verse number 11. <laughs> verse number 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what God gives us lastly beyond abundant pardon and abundant provisions? It gives abundant promises. Amen. We don't have time. A lifetime wouldn't be enough time to go through all the promises that we have in Christ. Amen. I've given you one already that when God saves us, He abundantly pardons us yes. all sins, past, Amen. present, and future. The promise of we cannot go to hell. God's given us the promise of providing for finances and for food and for family yes. and for friends. But here is a promise that we need, or here's a truth that we need to remember that God has given us so many promises. Why? In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, the Bible says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. We need to be, we need to be reminded of promises that are in the Bible. Why? It gives us a clean mind. It, it, keeps us, it keeps our mind clear. Promises from God simply says God's in control. Amen. That I may not understand all of how and why and when, but I know God has never done anything wrong. I know God has never broken a promise. Therefore, if God says he's going to do something for me, I can trust he's going to do something for me. Amen. It keeps our mind clear. It gives us a clean mind. The Bible says that all the promises in the Bible are going to come to pass. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Every promise in that Bible will come true. Let me just close you with this last illustration here. Kind of put a, a bullet point on it. William Bolt and his wife gave up their rooms one day at a resort for a family of a sick child who was in need of a room on a very stormy night. The father of that family promised to return the favor one day. That day came two years later in 1897 when William Bolt received a one-way ticket to New York, and he was given an address of 5th and West 34th Street. 
At that address stood a man named William Waldorf Astor. That man gave William Bolt the opportunity to manage the brand new hotel he had just built called the Waldorf, Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Bolt went on to manage that hotel until 1927. And William Bolt is credited with being the inventor of 24-7 hotel room service. So if you ever use that, you can thank William Bolt for that. But it goes back to Waldorf Astoria. Why? Because somebody in, Waldorf, somebody in Brother Waldorf's uh, family needed a room. They told uh, William Waldorf about that man who was William Bolt. And William Bolt became the manager of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. <coughs> You know what that man made? He made a promise. He said, one day I'm going to repay you for the grace that you've showed me. And two years later, that man repaid that promise. What a wonderful thing that that man did. But you know what? God has promised us so much more than a hotel to run or manage. <laughs> you know what God has promised us? He's promised us a mansion in heaven where we won't require room service. Amen. <laughs> Everything we need will always just be there Amen. at the speed of thought. Amen. He promised us eternal life and glorified eternal bodies. He's promised us an inheritance of gold, silver, precious stones, ruling and reigning with Christ in the millennium. Just as Bolt was promised uh, something based upon man's word, to whom Bolt had just simply showed kindness and humility, the promises that were made, are, that are made to us, are made by God, Amen. who all humility is wrapped up in Him, who all Amen. kindness is wrapped up in Him, and exemplified on the cross. Amen. You know, when God died on the cross, there He says, "It is finished." Amen. But He said, "Father, forgive Amen. them." Amen. That's a pardon that God has promised to all of us. Amen. If you're saved this morning, then you've gotten that pardon. Amen. What are you doing with that pardon? How are you living? A pardon life. Are you thankful for the for provisions you have? Are you thankful for the promises you have in Christ Jesus? The Bible says this in closing, Hebrews 8, 6, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he's the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. There's no better promise than the promises made by God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.